all my people, and if you're watching live, checking us out on YouTube, or listening on your favorite podcast provider, you are most definitely my people. Joining me tonight, he is a product of the Lockup Training Academy and the Kingdom of Limitless Wrestling star traveling through the indie scene. He's the victorious BRG. Brett, thanks for coming on Chat and Awesome Wrestling, man. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Living my best life, man. Just kind of hanging out, enjoying the, the evening. Um, I always like to start these interviews off always the same way, man. Uh, kind of a two-part question. One, what wrestling did you have exposure to as a kid? And two, what kind of made you decide you wanted to become a pro wrestler? I got very easy answers for that. One, I hated wrestling growing up. And the second part to that question will actually answer how I got into it. Uh, in 2011, I was 13 years old. And um, at that point, I was hanging out with my friends a lot. So um, they lived like three doors down from me. And I would always go over and they'd always talk about wrestling. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll start watching it. So I started watching it. January 2011, Edge got me completely into it. Because I was like a angsty 13 year old that liked everything rock and roll and like and thought that Edge was the coolest guy around. So fast forward to WrestleMania 27, I remember never being so excited for a match ever in my life for Edge versus Alberto Del Rio. And I remember that's the type of energy that I've never had since until Edge returned uh, in 2020. But besides that, that match itself, and it's always funny when I tell people that, um, that match is what made me want to become a professional wrestler. Edge versus Alberto Del Rio, WrestleMania 27. It was an eight-minute long match, but God, I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. I don't want to digress too far from uh, what you're doing right now, but what do you think about Edge in 2022 with the the matches he's putting on now? Uh, I mean, he is... The fact that he's going out on his own terms... And he's finishing up the career the way he wanted to. I'm really happy for him. Um, from what I've heard from other people, he's nothing but like a stand-up guy. And thank God, because it's like one of those scenarios where, oh, if you ever meet your hero, like, will you be disappointed? Like, if I ever do meet him, it'll be like a good, good feeling to know that I've heard nothing but good things about him. Um, the fact that some of the matches I've watched him have are like match of the year candidates it's fantastic that he can still go nine years later and it feels like he hasn't skipped the beat since I completely agreed there uh back to you though so when you did start training where did your training start for you as a wrestler so right so it's funny enough i actually live 10 minutes away from my original training school in woonsocket rhode island um you know, they gave me the basics and everything, but it wasn't, in my opinion, it wasn't enough to where I wanted to go. A lot of the guys there just kind of like stuck there and just like only wrestled there. I wanted more. I wanted to travel. I wanted to do all these things. And I knew that Matt Taven and Mike Bennett were training down in uh, West Warwick, Rhode Island, which my mom had literally just moved to at that point. So at... Around, I want to say 2017, I had about like three small, like very little, ex three years of like little exposure to the wrestling business. And I went to go train with Matt and it was primarily Matt that was training um, at the school at that time because Mike was on his way out because that was the year that he got signed to WWE. And Matt has been instrumental in the two years that I stood by him because he has him and uh, Vincent are two guys that literally showed me like character work is like a, such key component to wrestling that if you don't focus on a lot of your character work, the wrestling is the wrestling part. Like everybody's going to remember the wrestling part, but are they really going to remember the, the character itself that you are? So they really showed me that that was the, a big thing that you need to learn. And then it's so funny because at the Lockup Training Academy, who Ryan Waters is Matt Taven and Vincent's trainer, Ryan is so like nitty gritty breaking down a match to literally the smallest nitpicky things to where you get such a great idea of what psychology is and closing loops and making your matches just stand out amongst the rest, which I really enjoy. I feel like my path 
in wrestling has been the right way that I could have seen it because one, I'd never stuck by the same coach growing up in organized sports. I always like learn different things from different coaches. You need to learn the same exact thing when it comes to wrestling. I feel a lot of people just stay at the one school and just let them say, Oh yeah, you're doing great and not get the proper critique in order to help them advance. Looking at what you were just saying, just kind of playing off what you were talking about. When you start at somewhere like the Lockup Academy that spends so much time teaching you the in-ring psychology and building a match. And then when you get somewhere uh, with the Kingdom and Taven and you were speaking on Vincent, some of the character draws. uh, Do you feel like you're a student of the game in the sense that you're just adapting and being a sponge and just taking all this in from these great guys you get to spend time with? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the thing you'll notice in some of my matches um, from years past that I kind of cater to what I'm learning at the time. Um, A lot of my earlier stuff is like more focused on the psychology stuff. And it's more a little bit more of like the indie style. But that's also because I wasn't really like my psychology wasn't really there yet. Um, That's when I was training with Matt and then when I met Ryan for like I want to say the third time He really like sat down with me and was like you are good. You have so much potential But you need to capitalize on that potential He's like I and I remember sending him like a match that I had done recently and I shit you not he had like three paragraphs of like breaking it down like nitpicky nitpicky to where it's like you need to pick this guy's brain a little bit more because if you don't it's like you're you're missing out on you're missing out on like a key component that can help you further your career and honestly if it wasn't for ryan i feel like i wouldn't be um considered like a good worker if it wasn't for him Um, I'm not saying that to blow smoke up my own ass, but it's like a lot of people recently have been telling me like, oh, like I'm putting you in this spot because I trust you as a worker and I trust you for this and I trust you for that. I feel like I wouldn't be there if it wasn't for Ryan. And when it comes to Taven, I feel like my my character work and how I analyze character work wouldn't be the same without him. So like I said, learning from multiple coaches is honestly the way to go in my opinion. So working a lot in the Northeast, uh, we we've, we've haven't got there quite yet. Um, what is specifically like working for the crowd in that territory? I know Southern fans are very notorious for being loud and vocal. What's the, what's the indie scene like in the Northeast for you guys right now? It's so weird because no matter what state you go to, it's like, it's still different no matter what. So like, the three like main companies that i work for right now beyond uh limitless and northeast wrestling all three of them have like completely different crowds it feels like when you go to like wrestling open which is a part of beyond um a lot of those fans are like the local fans in the worcester area because um part of drew's vision and, uh, and paul crockett's vision for that is to be like a staple in the town there So it's a lot of people that are just coming in and watching wrestling for the first time. So you have people that aren't really familiar with it. Then you have fans that are in uh, Northeast wrestling, which kind of understand where this stuff goes. Like this, the hardcore, like you got the hardcore independent fans, like they followed like Matt Taven's journey. And then on top of that, you had guys like Malachi black, John Moxley, guys like that who would come in and like the fans would like come in droves for it. But at the same time, it's also a family friendly environment there. At Limitless, we call it the south of the north because it really you do get the southern vibe up in Maine. It's (laughs) it's kind of funny, but it's a very loud, very raucous crowd. But you also have like the independent fans that like to know everything that goes on, like want to follow all these independent guys from the independents to whatever major company they decide to sign with. So speaking on one of them, NCW, uh, you've had a lot of great success with this promotion. You're a four-time mm-hmm. heavyweight champion. What was it like the first mm-hmm. time they came to you and they were like, all right, Brett, you're going to be our guy. We're going to give you the strap. So it's so funny because NCW is like my first place that really took a chance on me. Um, when I was the first, when I was NCW champ for the first time, I was under a completely different ring name. 
completely different gimmick. It was really like working for the main event in that company really helped to give me a, a decent enough idea of like what a main event match should be. Not the full picture, but it at least gave me like a little taste of it to where I wanted more of it. Where I, and it was a good playground to start exploring like different ideas on how to get everything rolling, how to make a match entertaining, but also like captivating at the same time. It's a place where I've learned to grow and learn to try new things out. Um, yeah, I can't thank like Lumberjake and JC and Mike Pava enough for taking the chance on me in the first place. I remember when they told me, I was like, like kind of like thrown back because I'm skinny now, but like I was like 40 pounds skinnier then. And like, I was like, you want to take the chance you want to put the heavyweight title on like the scrawniest guy in the roster. I'm like, that's the, I, I, I'm like, thank you. Um, but it just goes to show that the reason I was given that opportunity was because I was like, so like I knew who I was and I'm such an annoying heel that they were like, you're, you're going to be our top guy. They started pushing me, pushing me, pushing me. And they gave me a, um, their version of the money in the bank. And literally like, one of the top moments of that year, one of the shocking moments is literally the heavyweight title match ended and it was like a lumberjack match. And then I emerged from the lumberjack with uh, the money in the bank and I won the whole title there. So it was, a, it was a, a hell of a moment for being in a company that I literally had started from like the first place to ever give me an opportunity. It's a good full circle moment. That's awesome. I like hearing about those, uh, those big homegrown stories when a guy comes up from the roots and has successes and mm -hmm. then he's able to, to carry it. Uh, when you're working there and you're working at some of these other promotions up there, you said you and you're uh, a great heel. Do you have a preference working heel or baby face? So lately I have been getting to dabble a lot more in baby face. Um, it is, it is fun. It's a completely more, it's essentially me on like 10 energy drinks when I'm a baby face. When I'm a heel, it's it's more subdued, but at the same time, it's still me. I played hockey growing up, and literally trash talking was in my like game plan all the time. And I would do anything to get in the guy's head. Like I was a centerman, so I would always go into the face off. And like at age twelve, I would like skate up to the guy at the at the circle and like spray him with snow, and then get ready to do and get ready to do the face off i remember there was one time the ref was like well that wasn't really nice i was like eh, whatever <laughs> but i was always trash talking like i would be mucking it up in the boards with some kid and i would just like give him an elbow and like talk shit to him it's the same kind of thing with me now as a heel like i'm just at home with it like i can i'll talk shit i'll do whatever i have no problem talking crap to the fans but at the same time it's like when I'm a baby face, I tend to use that same trash talking and just use it towards my opponent as opposed to the fans. So honestly, it's like, if you asked me like six months ago, I would have probably said heel. But lately, I've been like really vibing as a baby face. And I can't really deny that. I've always laughed at one of the my favorite phrases I was told once. A uh, friend on the show came on and he said, it's a lot easier to get them to hate you than it is to get them to love you. Uh, do you feel oh, like absolutely. it's easier to get heat than it is for to, for you to to get the shine as a baby face? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, people. So it's like it's it's kind of mean to say, but like a lot of people are like tend to be negative. So especially when you go to in front of a crowd that like barely knows you, it's really hard to like get that sympathy right out the gate. The only people that I see get that every single time, and and it's waves and curls um they're like the tag team up here the, the tag team that's breaking out right now they're some of my best friends every time they come out they come out to, i want to dance with somebody by whitney houston <laughs> and trayvon just has this energy that like nobody can match and they're probably one of my favorite teams to wrestle because it's so easy because when that happens it's me talking shit them uh clapping right back with all their insults and we're just having some fun there I wrestled them the most out of any team last year, and I don't regret any match at all because it's just so much fun. 
so you touched on it a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and dive in. Uh, Beyond Wrestling, Wrestling Open. Uh, these mm-hmm. guys are just blazing through IWTV right now. Huge on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've done some work uh, up there, Stetson Ranch, as a tag team. Uh, kind of talk on Beyond Wrestling and Wrestling Open and the chance to, to kind of get up there and do that. And then maybe what's it like when you have to work as a singles wrestler and a tag team wrestler? And I know that might seem like a lot to chew on, but kind of uh, blend it all together as best you can for me, I guess. <laughs> hey, I mean, you can see I can talk for hours at this point. Uh, I'm a, <laughs> sometimes I have to stop myself from talking. But it's like Beyond Wrestling was like one of the places that kind of like I didn't know what independent wrestling was when I first started. I really didn't. Like, I saw, like, what the the school I was starting at, I saw, like, one of their shows. I was like, oh, okay. And then I went to a Beyond Wrestling show in, like, 2015, and I was like, what the heck is this? Like, this is completely different. I'm not going to say how because I'm not going to be mean, but this is completely different than what I'm, I'm used to. And then I just remember it was always, like, in the background. But until, like, this year... Or last year, I was in the Discovery Gauntlet last year for um, with Prestigious, but it was kind of wild that that was like my first real exposure to independent wrestling, and now I'm working for them. Wrestling Open is like a subsidiary of them; um, they are trying to make it its own thing. Um, and Wrestling Open is pretty fun. I'm not gonna lie, because like I said, it's a lot of like the local fans coming in and seeing wrestling for the first time. And we have to introduce them to it. And it's just wild to me that a lot of these people like don't know wrestling and I'm being one of the first people to introduce them to wrestling. Singles wrestling versus tag team wrestling. There's some days I hate tag wrestling. There's some days I hate singles wrestling. I'm more so like being a singles wrestler just because I have more control on what story I want to tell. As a tag team wrestler in the Stetson Ranch, I was for a bit the comedic relief um a little bit of comedic relief just coming out on a hobby horse and wearing like an outlandish cowboy hat i mean it's a silly silly thing because the guy that stetson is the one and only new jersey cowboy that's his gimmick so new jersey cowboy i don't know what that is um i mean you're great stetson you're you're fantastic but i still don't understand what it is and the thing with that is it's like i always like when it comes to wrestling open, people see like a different side of me. They see me on the hobby horse and they see me wearing the outlandish hat, but I still tailor it back to who I am as a person. I'm very money driven. Like I like working hard and I like having success. And when I'm given like a boatload of money, I tend to go a little bit crazy and like spend happy. <laughs> so that's what I tailored it when I started working for the, the one and only New Jersey cowboy who has all this money and is like a rich cowboy from New Jersey. He's paying me to be in the Stetson Ranch, and I'm taking that money, and I'm just having a blast because I'm carefree right now. I can do whatever the hell I want. Lately, I've had a little bit of a tone shift where I'm like, I'm tired of being like seen as a joke. And this past Thursday, I put in like a really hard hitting match, um, which I really enjoy. I do enjoy like d- throwing like stiff shots and like being and like showing people that like i am tough i'm you may not think it when you first see me but i am um that's not again that's not to blow smoke up my own ass it's just the truth i like dabbling in both tag team and singles wrestling for different reasons because there's two different psychologies when it comes to both and being able to like work on both and feeling like you're you're learning and learning in both aspects it's it's a fun experience to know that no matter what if i'm like if i let's say i perfect singles wrestling one day and i just like there's nothing else for me to learn which is impossible but we're just going to do it as a hypothetical i know that i still have tag team wrestling that i can still keep learning and keep wanting to get better at so that's i i really can't choose on <laughs> like what's better but personally that's like that's the the fun of it all is that no matter what you're going to keep learning when you're in the ring and you you said just now when you're working with the 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 original jersey cowboy uh building your character keeping the crowd entertained but also displaying your athleticism how do you balance all of these things and spin all these plates at once 
it's just a matter of repetition 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 i've wrestled so much in these last couple of years that i've finally figured out like one of the right moments to display my character and one of the right moments to turn it up and make sure that the my opponent's beaten down to the point where i can flourish that energy the thing is is you can't show all that energy right in the beginning or else if you bring that if you bring the crowd all the way up to a 10 then you can't really go any higher so you have to give them just like let's say a six right in the beginning of the match and slowly it builds and it builds and it's built and then you get like the full character at, at a 10 later on in the match when there's literally like you're about to finish the entire thing it's it's i don't know if this makes sense but it's like you have to you have to pick and choose your moments in which you display your character or your the emotion the energy the stuff that you want to get across to the audience but you also can't make your opponent look stupid by displaying all that and then they're just sitting there like okay well Let's get a move on. Okay, so looking at it in the three, I'll say, I don't want to say three different levels, but you'll get what I'm getting at when I get there. Mm-hmm. Seeing the the shows at your training school and where you first started, then having a chance mm-hmm. to get it to beyond. You've also had a chance to work AEW Dark, Dark Elevation. Uh, you had mm-hmm. a great match against the factory. Having seen, you know, uh, the different levels of wrestling now what were some of the biggest takeaways when you had a chance to work for AEW? uh well it's very it's very different um i didn't find out that i was having a match um they changed the board like three times when i was there so i was like oh i don't have a match they changed it again i was like oh i still don't have a match and then literally i saw them changing the board again i was like i was literally like eyes were wide open staring at that board and i just saw a b and i started seeing them spell out my name i was like yes thank god (laughs) in this in a moment like that it's like you kind of have to know what what your whole thing is being in worcester and working AEW was such a fun experience because i literally wrestle two minutes down the road from where AEW was filming that day so there's a lot of fans there that know who i am i remember being in the ring and starting off the match and you could hear everybody going BRG, BRG. And it was so, it was loud enough. It wasn't like Daniel Bryan levels of uh, intensity, but it was loud enough to where QT was like acknowledged it. He's like, is that you? I was like, yeah. And he just gives me the, the, the fuck you essentially. Yeah. <laughs> the Italian fuck you. And then just dips. In that situation, I'm like, okay, I, I, I want to acknowledge that I hear them. But at the same time, I don't want to take away from the factory because they are the sole purpose of this match is to make them look good i don't want to like go crazy like get on the top rope and like turn my energy up to a 10 no i want to keep it as subdued as possible because it's not my match it's not for me it's for them although it's a fantastic opportunity it's for them to make sure that they they get over as best as possible and i feel i did that in that match um when it comes to beyond, it's like a little more free reign. You get, you find out when you get there, like what's the story of the match and you have to, and this is how I am with everything. What's the story of the match and just try and get it across as best as possible. And just remember where the focus lies. Cause I hate the idea that people are like, Oh, let me get all my stuff in. It's like, I could, I could go without doing any moves in a match as long as the story gets across and though as long as the story gets across i'm happy with everything so completely out of left field unrelated to wrestling completely what outside of wrestling do you do to kind of keep you busy on a a a free day if you have those things what's (laughs) kind of (laughs) cheating but i watch wrestling but um at the same time um i like watching movies um i love watching um watch hockey a lot i'm a big montreal canadians fan which in new england is kind of taboo but it's whatever um and then uh, i play video games a lot 
Uh, I love video games. I just uh, my girlfriend got me a PS5 recently, and it's been oh man, she she definitely knows that I love her now <laughs> for sure. Um, but like recently, I've been playing like, the Guardians of the Galaxy game on the PS5. Such a great game. Funny enough, mentioning how like I'm so focused on like the story and my matches. I love video games with stories in them, like really good stories. Like if you have like great gameplay, it's like essentially like the best way to put it. A video game with like great gameplay and a bad story is like watching like a a wrestling match with like great technical work, but you're not really invested in the characters. Those are the matches I don't really like personally. I love a good story. I love being in, jumping into a story. Like I love those games. Like uh, Until Dawn, I played a game called The Quarry recently. There's very little gameplay, but the story, you're like, what's going to happen next? What can I do next? And specifically in those last two games, like the whole point is to make sure that like your characters don't die. So you have to make the right decisions. So like I literally stopped, I, I literally went through The Quarry three times just to try and get everybody to survive. And it took forever and it was so frustrating because you're there's like 10 chapters. Let's say you're seven hours in and someone dies because you made like the dumbest decision, but it seemed right in the moment. And then you're like, fuck, <laughs> that was a moment where, and here's the thing. I didn't keep going. I stopped and started all over again. So I saw the same intro three nights in a row and played <laughs> through it three nights in a row. It's like, oh, I love video games, but they can be so fucking frustrating sometimes, especially on games like that. I'm an RPG guy. I spent a lot of time playing Fallout and Skyrim style games. And one of the big things See, for I love... me was Fallout 4 in the hardcore mode. If you don't sleep, your game doesn't save. So you would spend oh. an hour, two hours jamming, just getting through, and then you die. And you realize you hadn't slept in that two hour period. So all the work you've done, just gone. <laughs> yep. That's, um, I've been playing Resident Evil. Like I, I've been playing like the Resident Evil Two, like the original on my PlayStation Two, and it is so frustrating because there was a point where I was Claire, and I was going through like the the bottom half. I don't know if you played Resident Evil Two at all oh, or yeah. the remake, but you're like in the the basement area of the police station, and when I walk around the corner, I'm like at red health, and there's a liquor right there. And I'm like, son of a bitch, I have barely any ammo. <laughs> so I eventually figured out a way to get around that because I wasn't restarting that, that game. And then it took a little bit before I actually restarted it. But it's like that, and then I'll play. Uh, the remake is fantastic. Um, I love playing Resident Evil. It's probably one of my favorite franchises. Um, what other games do I freaking like? Oh, you mentioned RPGs. I love Mass Effect. Another Mass great Effect one, is yeah. Like, it's my favorite trilogy because I love space operas. I, I'm a big Star Wars guy. So I love anything that's like set in space, sci-fi, all those things. I'm really hoping Mass Effect comes out with a new game that's not Andromeda because Andromeda was hot trash. But I replayed the trilogy recently and I'm still on three. Personally, like I like one and two, three is okay. So like once I got to three, I was like, eh, okay, whatever. But like the suicide mission is like one of my favorite missions in like all of gaming. Um, Mass Effect Two is probably like up there on my top ten list of games. It's just like I said, great story. Like I don't <laughs> care about the gameplay as much, just the story. And that's like a perfect example of like a great story and a great game. And oh man, I wish the the, the ending wasn't so bad in the the trilogy. Oh, I wish it wasn't so bad or else it would be like top tier, like number one for sure. I feel like there's a lot of things, be it video games or movies or TV shows where you get highly invested and then the ending sucks and you're like, what the hell was that? Yeah, that's like, <laughs> that's kind of how I feel about like my favorite game like ever, which is uh, Sly 2, uh, Band of Thieves. I don't know if you ever played that. I know, of like, it. Yeah, I know what it is. So I've beaten that game 15 times. Like hundred percent. Like it's not hard to hundred percent it, but like it was my game growing up. And like I look back at it now and the story is so good, especially for a children's game. And the ending, you're like, uh, I mean, like it's fine, but it's like it's not as 
captivating as I once thought when I was a kid. Now, again, it's a children's game. So, like, what can you do? But it has a lot of mature tones to it, which I really liked. Excellent. All right, Brett. I close all of my interviews with five rapid fire questions. I got yours queued up. You ready? Yep. What's your favorite food? Tacos. Love tacos. What's your favorite movie? Um, Casino Royale. That's a great one. So are you a Bond guy or is it just that specific Be- one? No, I love Bond. Who's your favorite Especially Bond? Especially Daniel, Daniel Craig. Perfect. Okay. I was going to, yeah. uh, that doesn't count. That's not one of your five. Who's your favorite musician or performing artist? Oh, okay. Um, my favorite band in general is a band called Volbeat. Um, I know Volbeat. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're one of my favorite, they're like my favorite band. I just started listening. I just found out that they um, got a new album that came out last year. So I was like, why didn't I know about this? So I've been listening to it. Another one, just to cheat a little bit, uh, Thrice. I also really like Thrice. I saw them in concert last uh, last October. Nice. What's your favorite venue you've wrestled in? Oof. Um, ah, damn, that's a tough one. I am going to say probably the NEW Arena uh out in connecticut the the energy is always there it's a fun place what is your favorite pay-per-view as a fan of wrestling uh nxt takeover new orleans i was there i saw it live it was fantastic the energy was like you can't you can't top it it was so much fun best pay-per-view of all time there's just something about being at a big fight energy pay-per-view event no just about no matter what company you go to if you go to a big event for a company and they really Mm -hmm. did a good job of hyping it just that electricity Mm -hmm. just makes you want to keep going i've rewatched it like five times it's such a fun pay-per-view there's no match that like under delivers at all all right this is my favorite part of the episode man plug your stuff tell everybody where to find you what you have coming up and what's going on Mm -hmm. All right. So it's very easy to find me. All my social medias are very simple. Victorious underscore BRG. That's for Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, TikTok, I'm pretty famous on there. So if you want to give it a follow, feel free. Uh, You can be part of 258,000 followers there. Cheap plug, but whatever. Um, And then this Saturday upcoming, I have uh, Northeast Wrestling, the show without a name. Uh, for anybody that's in the area and wants to come by, uh, feel free. We have guys like Matt Taven. Uh, we, we have uh, Trayvon Jordan facing Danny Ma for the heavyweight title. And then I will be facing uh, one half of the NEW Tag Champs, Waves and Curls. I'll be facing Trayvon's tag partner, Jalen Brandon. Uh, upcoming, uh, we also have, you'll see me at Wrestling Open pretty much every Thursday. Uh, I have Worcester, Massachusetts at the White Eagle. Uh, uh, We have Pro Wrestling Super Show's Genesis on November 4th. You can catch me there. And then for right now, I think that's it. Uh, Oh, Pioneer Valley Pro Wrestling on October 22nd. You will find me there in uh, the Western Massachusetts area. Excellent, man. Well, I appreciate you stopping by and chatting about some wrestling. Yeah, this has been fun. Good time. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. But now as we close another episode of Botch Bots and Chair Shots, I want to take a minute and thank you for listening. Remind you to go wherever you do anything on the internet. Like, follow, subscribe, unsubscribe, then subscribe again. Leave a comment telling me how terrible I sound or how terrible or how great I am. Either way, it helps the algorithm and it helps find new listeners. For the victorious BRG, I'm the Will Gray. Thanks for stopping by and listening, my people.